Hello, everybody. Um, this is um, uh, welcome to lecture five um, of the executive black belt class or executive green belt class if you're a green belt. Um, uh, this was, if you attended today, this was not the lecture that you saw. It's going to be very, very similar. Um, unfortunately, my computer crashed at the very end and uh, I was unable to save the recording. Um, However, I uh, do want to talk through uh, pretty quickly in terms of uh, what we want to cover today. So first, I, I want to take you through a, a sh very short tutorial of Excel statistics. Uh, we're going to be using that this week um, and um, very minimal mini tab on Thursday. Um, we're also going to cover how to conduct, by the way, if you're a green belt, that's not absolutely necessary to have any tab. Just make sure you have Excel statistics. We'll also cover how to conduct data analysis, and this is more of a philosophical section. And finally, we'll go through plenty of examples. Okay, so that's the plan uh, today. We're going to probably move a little bit faster. We had a great session today with lots of work and, and uh, pinging back and forth with uh, people and examples. Uh, from the people on the line. I wish I could share that with you. I'll try and share my to the best I can recall, uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately it did crash. Apologize about that. Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and move on and uh, and uh, and uh, move on with the uh, with the with the lecture. So let's start by looking at Excel statistics. And um, you'll notice that I've got two icons here on my desktop, one for Excel statistics, I've called it XP, and one for 2007. Um, if you've downloaded, if you haven't yet downloaded and installed both the data files and Excel statistics, you will need to do that. There's a video on the website that shows you how to do it. Um, which you can watch. I think it's an eight-minute video. Uh, it'll tell you how to download it and unpack it and all that. So I should then set it up. So you should be all set. Um, now, what Excel statistics is is really just a package of um, Excel um, spreadsheets, and um, it's not an extra. There's no real code. I, I should say there's no real application. It really just uses Excel. Um, which is good and bad. Um, so it has some clunkiness to it, but uh, the nice thing is it's 100% in Excel. It's not an add-on. There's no um, you know, major charge for it. Uh, you'll notice that there's two versions. I'm going to show you both, um, but it's all driven by uh, the data, which is why we like it, or why I like it. So I'm going to show you the basics um, and uh, and uh, we'll open it up in both, and I'll show you how to do the, uh, basic analysis in both, and then we'll just kind of walk through it, okay? Um, all right, so let me show you first the layout. Here's what it looks like in Excel 2003 or before. Uh, when you click on it, you'll, you'll see um, if you've got medium security, you'll see disable acro, uh, macros, enable, or more info. In order to use Excel stats, you have to enable the macros. It does have some macros. Um, if you have your Excel on high security, um, it will not let you run the macros. You have to put it on medium security, uh, and then the macros will be able to run. If you have it on low security, you won't even see this. Um, but you should have it on at least medium security. OK. I'm just going to click Enable Macros and just show you what happens. In 2007, this is what you end up seeing. You end up seeing a palette um, and a number of buttons. And uh, you also see, hopefully, that there's been a, uh, a menu that has been added up here. OK, and it has some arcane language up here, one num, one cat, one num, one cat. We're going to get through to the bottom right here. We're going to go through one num, one cat, one num, one cat, two cat, and two num today. Okay, so this is what it looks like in Excel 
2003 and before. Now let me show you what it looks like in 2007. It looks a little bit different. Oops, no, it doesn't look like that. Sorry about that, folks. I'm going to send it to 2007. There it is. This is what it looks like in 2007. You again get the enable macro. You need to enable them. And this time there's no palette, but there is a menu bar. And if you click on it, it has, you'll notice, very similar sorts of things put up there. Okay? So that is that for the moment. Okay, so now let's um, take a look at how, uh, what are some features of, of Excel statistics. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a data file. And it's any old data file, but we'll just pick on, um, let's see, product demand. So this is sales data for a certain product. Very simple, two columns, which week the data were taken in, and this is the sales um, which we're calling demand for a product, okay? So um, very straightforward. The way that, that Excel statistics works is you select the data. Now notice, you don't copy it, you just select it. Once they are selected, uh, including the titles, you go up and you pick the particular thing that you want to do. I, I'm going to pick one num, and you'll understand why later. But right now, just don't worry about it. You just pick, you select it, and then you pick what you want. I just want to show you speech. So first of all, um, there's a, always an information page. It opened up a specific spreadsheet associated with one num. There's always an information folder or a page where it tells you what you're looking at. OK, and then there's usually a data and description summaries, and then some other things that are there. In this case, tests and extra tools. But those tend to vary by the function that you use. Let's go back to date, data and description. I just want to show you some of the features uh, here. First of all, you'll see a drop-down menu with week. You'll recall that was in our data set. But there was also demand. And there it is right there. So if we wanted to look at week, which is not really all that interesting, which week it is, instead let's look at demand. And so in this case, we're looking at a few different things. We're looking at the average demand up here. There's the number, 46 of them. There's the average standard deviation. Coefficient of variation, which is the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean, um, which may not sound all that interesting, but if you think of it, the mean is kind of like that's the average, right? The standard deviation for those of you who I think pretty much everybody is in that conversation. We already know what that is. That tells me something about the spread of the data, particularly if the data are normal. This happens to be the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. And it tells me something about the noise, standard deviation spread, uh, spread of data has to do with sort of the uncertainty. The noise, or the variation, the noise of the, the data compared to the mean, which is kind of the signal. So if you're in engineering, you're very comfortable with the concept called signal to noise ratio. This is like the inverse of that. It's noise to signal ratio. So making that noise to signal very low is a desirable property in a lot of uh, processes. So that could be a measure that you would look at. We're going to not look at skewness for a while uh, right now. But it tells you a little bit about the min, the quartiles, and so forth. OK, anyway, uh, there's lots of things that are here. And I could go on about the data, but I'm not. I want to show you that. Anything that's in red, you can double click on and it will give you help, online help. So if there's something like right here, data is red, I double click on that and it tells me lots of stuff about the data. I can clear the data, I can link the data, it says the data goes in column A. Okay, there's lots of different things I can do. If I click on numerical summaries for demand, it tells me what that is. Common numerical summaries for your data are shown in this table. Okay, great. If I click on frequency chart, it tells me a little bit about that frequency chart, what it actually means. So it's a, it's a really nice feature if you're confused about what to do with a certain plot or how to interpret it. You do have to actually read it so um, um, in order to be useful, but there it is for you. OK, so that's everything in red. Everything in blue, on the other hand, um, if, if something is in blue, that means it's changeable. 
So and, and variable. So for example, uh, classes, which we're going to find out is related to the number of boxes in the histogram or frequency chart. Uh, if we change that, it'll change the number of boxes. Let me change it to something that's not very helpful. Two. You'll see what I mean. Bam, that's two. If I change it to 15, it does 15. I think the default is 10. If I change the from and the to, the default is to go from the min to the max. I might want to spread that out a little bit. If I instead go from, instead of 4.5 to 11, I'll go from 1 to 15. And voila, there it is. Um, I've gone now from 1 to 15. And now I could even tighten that up if I wanted to by going from, say, from 3 to 12, whatever. Okay? And then any of the, the things that are around it are clickable as well. So if I click histogram, let's see what that does. Whoops. There it is. Click histogram. And that helps me a little bit. And, <clears throat> and sometimes there are, like on the summaries tabs, there are even other things that we can do with it. For example, I can change the axes. You see how that changes that but from frequency to proportion or to percentage. I can show the values. So these are some things that are pretty commonly in there, which is kind of nice. Okay. I'm going to uh, go back to the first page again. All right, so those are some common things. Um, I do also want to show you um, in Excel statistics, there's a couple of different things that are nice about this. Uh, I do want to show you what happens if I create a display or some numbers that I want to keep. Uh, all, I, all I need to do is cut and paste those, uh, or copy and paste. Uh, I can do it in a normal sense, but I can also use a button called the record button. So if I click on the record button right here, you see if I look down, there it is right there, record. And I do that, I hit the record, and it automatically makes a copy uh, in a picture form. That's a picture now for cutting and pasting into PowerPoint or what have you. Uh, if I hit this, these little trying or these little arrows, take me back and forth very often. So if I hit this, it's going to take me back. I hope to where I was. Lo and behold, it did. Okay, so um, those are some of the features uh, um, that you can see. One last thing I want to show you before I show you how this all looks in Excel 2007 is um, the help file. This actually has helpful help. Uh, unlike a lot of things. So it gives you a home page. Uh, Rodney Carr, who's the developer of this, uh, lives in uh, Australia. And he's at Deakin University. Good guy. Um, but there's an overview. So if you just want to get the gist of how it works, if you click on this, it should open up a uh, an overview of it. Okay. Uh, there's also a manual, believe it or not, and it's here. So if you want the usual manual, click on that, and you can go through the manual, baby. I mean, there it is. Um, all the stuff right there. Okay, including quick start and all the rest. I'm going to close that up. Close that. Okay. And last but not least, if you are, whoops, I lost my Excel stats. By the way, that does happen from time to time where it disappears off the menu. If it does, just go ahead and reopen it. Um, the last one is there's actually a guided tour movie. So if you're into watching movies, uh, bring lots of popcorn on this one because this is a cliffhanger. No, just kidding. It's about a 10-minute long movie uh, in a screen cam. And it's pretty cool that it exists. So uh, this one just happens to go ahead and play. I'll show you how it happens in 2007, a little bit different. If you play the movie, um, here it is opening up Lotus Screen Cam. That's right, it really is Lotus. Um, and there's a little sort of a VCR type controller here that'll stop or start the, th the movie. And it'll tell you how to do all the different things install, from installing to actually looking at data. Okay. So let me stop that. You can stop it or restart it, or you can pause it, etc. Okay? So that's how that works. That's Excel stats. I'm going to show you, uh, uh, let me close this down. 
And you'll notice I'm clicking no on the saves. You don't want to save these things. You want to instead, uh, because that will change the data that's in them. And sometimes your defaults, so you want to keep those. Um, you, what you'll want to do is you'll want to save the, the pictures that you create from them. And those, you'll notice, get saved in the data file on something called Excel Statistics Record Sheet. So it's kind of cool. Okay, let me close this down also. Okay. Um, so now let me open this up and I'll show you what it looks like in Excel 2007. Okay, so here's what Excel statistics looks like. Let's see what our data looks like and how you'd access it in 2007. It turns out the same way. And it's going to do the same sort of thing. Again, you select the data. In this case, I'm going to select the columns. Oops, and notice that Excel statistics isn't up there, so that probably means I'm going to have to reopen it. Okay. Okay, here we are in Excel statistics with um, the product demand. Again, we just select it and then we have to select whatever is the particular item that we want, in this case one num, and it works exactly the same way. It does happen to be a little bit slower in Excel statistics, uh, I'm sorry, in 2007, and that is largely because of Microsoft. Um, Microsoft did a lot of things in their Excel um, that slowed down their macros uh, for 2007 and 2010. Nothing we can do about that. Um, but anyway, that's what uh, goes on in here. You can see the same sort of things happen if I want to go to 8. There it is, it changes that. And if I have 15, there it is, it changes the numbers. Okay, so it all kind of works the same. Uh, if I want to look at the movie, let me show you what that looks like. The guided tour movie, if I click on that, it may play the movie or it may direct me to open up a file. If it does direct me to open up a file, go ahead and open up that file. It will be an SCR file. Okay, and that is that. Okay, if you have additional questions on Excel statistics, um, please do um, please do go ahead and ask um, and uh, call me. I should say that the 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 uh, assignment that's due um, that we're, you're going to get later today um, will require a lot of work. Um, and it's going to be one that uh, will require you to use Excel statistics. So don't skimp on it. Uh, make sure you download it and, uh, and use it. Okay. Without further ado, we're going to go into the second part, which is how to conduct data analysis. And we're picking up on slide two of week three. So we're going to cover how to conduct data analysis. We're going to cover uh, some data analysis examples. And we're also going to give, uh, <clears throat> well, we're going to stop there. But that's going to be enough. Um, you'll find that there's, there's a lot that we're, um, that we're uh, covering in this lecture. OK. Um, so without further ado, let's talk a little bit about it. So this happens to be my philosophy. Uh, and it comes from a lot of uh, experience both as a consulting statistician, as an engineer prior to that, this was in the 90s, and, um, and as a master black belt, uh, largely in the last decade. Um, I've noticed a lot of things that professional uh, analysts do and don't do, um, and a lot of characteristics that I think are going to help you. My goal here uh, is to get you to a situation, not to make you uh, this super, super duper analyst, but instead to get you to a point where Selecting a tool isn't going to be onerous um, where you're going to have some, con some comfort in knowing that you did the right thing. And if you don't have that, 
at least some comfort in in uh, in figuring out how you might find that out. Okay, so uh, it's essentially giving you a little bit of an algorithm for proceeding, and then we'll go through some examples on that algorithm. Okay. Um, obviously, you can use it here in the Mac process, but you and multiple places, but you can also use it. Um, you can also use it in everyday uh, everyday analysis for business. So now the, the, there are some there are some things that kind of motivate having a model, and there are some things that are are going to be some principles. So let's go through those first. So first of all, um, just to mention, the statistical analysis to a lot of people is uh, is you know worse than pulling teeth, um, and or having teeth pulled, I should say. A lot of people are are terribly phobic about it, and I think a lot of that happens to be happens to be because first of all, it's a foreign language. Mathematics is a foreign language to most folks, and you got to learn it. Uh, you got to learn a little bit of it to be able to be effective. Um, and also, it seems I think to most people that's largely memorizing. Memorize the techniques and the tests, and that's how you get good at this. Well, there is some memorization, but what I found is that um, once you once you can kind of see what the algorithm is, you don't have to memorize so much, and you can focus on um, interpreting the analysis instead of saying how do I choose which one, how do I calculate which one, which is great. Um, we will be delving into in a much bigger way some of the other things later, particularly regression. We're going to really drill. Um, but uh, this is going to get us uh, a pretty far, uh, pretty far. So that's the first case: is it's a system, and it's a system for essentially when I'm confronted with the data that maybe I've gotten to us in a spreadsheet, maybe in multiple columns. Um, how do I go about choosing what to analyze when? How do I know when I'm done? Okay, so that's kind of the background. Here are the different principles of what you're going to see. First of all, the key concepts are keep the simple solutions first. Right? Keep it, use the KISS principle, which means keep it simple statistically. Okay, what that translates into in our world is analysis for one variable is simpler than analysis for two variables is simpler than analysis for three variables. This may be contrary to the way that most people think. And uh, most people think that, hey, let's throw everything into this analysis all at once and see how it all works. That's far too complex uh, to start out that way. So instead, we go the other way. We start with one, two, three, four, and build up knowledge on what we do know. Okay. Second concept is there's never any analysis in the back in a vacuum. Most of you, I think, will have no problem with this. We mathematicians have more of a problem because we like to think of things in an abstract way. In fact, if you recall your high school algebra or your junior high algebra, or wherever, whenever you started taking it, the problems were always, you know, y equals mx plus b solve for x, or, you know, something like that. Well, in the real world, you're not solving for x, you're solving for real world things, like um, the cycle time that it takes somebody to do something. Okay? Don't forget that. Math, at its heart, people forget that numbers at their base level come from something. We made them up. We made them up in order to des describe something with more precision. And numbers can be more precise. But they're not as rock hard and rock solid and austere as we're always taught to believe. The answer to 2 plus 2 is 4. Done. Period. So does that mean if we see something in a table that it's done? Period? No. There's a story behind that data. How were they collected? How are they, how are they, how are the numbers crunched and put together? Could they have been put together in a different way that would give us a different picture? This is a skill that people need to develop, just as a skill, uh, just as one has skills with language, and so and it's interpretive. And the point to, that we're going to take away is that all of our analysis has to be done in the context in which it comes from. Last thing is we're going to make a conclusion after each calculation. Each time we do a calculation, each time we do a piece of analysis. We have to make some concluding statement or statements about that analysis. You know, are we going to keep the changes that we did? Are we going to conclude that yes, there is an effect, or, or maybe no, there isn't? Um, and if there is a cause and effect relationship, 
uh, how can we do anything about it? Um, and I think that gets to the heart of this whole analysis paralysis um, notion. Okay, one last thing before we get going. Uh, I am very much, like I think a lot of people, I'm a very much a picture-driven thing, and I have three rules uh, for a good to be a good data analysis, a, a data analyst. I think a lot of people who are considered to be good analysts aren't because they don't follow this, these rules. Um, the three rules are, first, plot the data. Got to make a plot. Second rule, plot the data. Again, third one is plot the data again. Now, I'm not saying plot the same way. <laughs> I'm saying maybe find a different plot that's going to be another option for looking at the data, maybe give you a different perspective. But the point is um, that plots reveal things or graphs reveal things that calculations cannot or do, uh, do or do so very poorly. Let's take the notion of outliers. Um, outliers are very, very difficult to see in a table, and they're often very difficult to see in a file, but they're child's play to see in a plot. And outliers are often where we really find uh, the improvements or the information that we need. Uh, they're information rich. But also things like shapes of data. We can get into trouble using things like using summaries like means or standard deviations or medians without understanding the shape of the data or where the data accumulates. So a plot will help us with that. Okay. One last thing before we go in. There are numerical and categorical data types. Um, we're going to start with this. Um, most statisticians will tell you that there are lots and lots of different types of data. There's, um, there's continuous data. There's ratio data. There's ordinal data. There's nominal data. There's discrete data. There's attribute data. Let's, for the moment, forget all that stuff. All that's true, of course, and maybe it's helpful. But I think for us, what we want to really think is there are two essential cuts of types of data. One is data that I use as numbers, and one is data that I use as sort of text. Okay? So um, let's just look at an example. And, and that's going to drive, by the way, that's going to drive which tools we select. That's why it's relevant. It's going to drive which tools and which analyses we select. Let's first look at categorical data. Category data is fairly straightforward. You, you'll know it when you see it. <laughs> it's stuff that is categories. Okay. So, for example, the color of a car, it might be red, black, green, or silver. In this case, there are many categories, uh, and there's no inherent order to them. Um, if I coded them, I may as well code red as one, or red could be two, or red could be three. It doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. That's uh, there's it's it's that's kind of typical. On the other, or that's one 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 type of category data. Another type is yes or no, a binary. Like uh, was it fixed right the first time? Uh, that's a binary. Uh, it could be yes or no, or it could be one zero, uh, something like this. Um, on time delivery is one of those things. Our first call resolution was it resolved or was it not? Okay, and then there are other types of things. Uh, like person's gender, or something like this. Numerical data is something a little bit different. Numerical data are things that we can represent as numbers that are meaningful as numbers. So, for example, phone numbers are not numerical data. Why? Because you can't really add, subtract, multiply, divide them. You know, what's my telephone number minus uh, minus your telephone number? Probably is a meaningless answer. Um, on the other hand, um, something like my age minus your age might be a meaningful answer. It might tell you how much older I am than you or younger uh, in some rare cases, perhaps. Um, but, um, but in any event, a numerical data, if we have it, tells us more than categorical data because it not only tells us whether something is true, but it tells us how true it is. So. Um, some other tip-offs are if a, if a number has units associated with it, like cycle time might be in um, cycle time in minutes um, or cycle time in hours. Or I might look at temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if it has units associated with it, it's usually a numerical, uh, uh, it's numerical data. One last thing is make sure that number isn't, just because a number is coded 
It doesn't necessarily mean it's, you're going to use it as a number. The eye color example that we gave before, we could have done, or the car color, could have been red, green, blue, or whatever. Um, we could have coded that anywhere, anyway. So one minus three doesn't necessarily mean anything in that context. Okay. All right. Now I want to show you how the algorithm works. It's given in the slides right here, but I think uh, I think instead what I want to do is talk through an example, and I think you'll you'll see it uh, a little more clearly. So let's go back to our blackboard or whiteboard. Ooh, I guess I'm going to go to the blackboard, and uh, let's walk through this methodology. So this methodology involves two props, two props. Okay, the first thing is the process box. And you're going to hear me say this all the time, draw the box, draw the box, draw the box. It's something I strongly believe in. The process box is a way of helping you understand what questions you're going to ask about the data. So, uh, for example, let's suppose that we are, we are, um, we work at a restaurant, let's say a, a, a large uh, restaurant, and we care about the time, I'm going to call it cycle time, and I'll define that as the, the time to deliver an order, time from customer order to table. So I said I want the uh, I want the um, pasta primavera. How long did it take before between when I made that order and when it came to the table? I could define it in a different way. I could say between when I sat down at the table and when I got my order. But let's just say between when I made the order and when I received it at the table. So cycle time in this case would be an output. It's a results variable. I could also look at other types of results variable like um, the quality. And this might be, if I look at the quality, put it over here I suppose, of the food, maybe it's good, bad, or ugly. Okay, good, bad, or ugly uh, type of food. Maybe just good or bad. Sorry, Clint Eastwood. Okay, so in this case, um, we've got two different, fundamentally different types of measurement. Uh, if you're following this, quality is a cat variable. I'll mark that with a C and cycle time is a number variable. On my right hand side I'm going to list things that are potential drivers. Now if you already have them in the spreadsheet that's easy. If you're collecting data you can write these things down. So for example I might want to look at the quality by waiter or wait person. I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to use a sexist wait, wait, uh, it's a man waiter, let's say, uh, by waiter, W-A-I-T-E-R. Or I might look at it by shift. Or I might want to look at it by um, price on the menu. Or I might want to look at it uh, by the oven temp. Okay, all these are different variables that I may or may not have in my, in my uh, data set. Now the first thing I'm going to do is uh, once I've listed all the measurements, all the relevant measurements that I've got, I'm going to label them as N or C just like I have over here. So waiter would be categorical, shift would be category, price would be number, oven temp would be number. Okay, <clears throat> and then I'm going to, once I've got this, for each pair, and I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on cycle time. Okay, so I'm just going to circle that one. For each pair, then, I'm going to take the first thing. So, so once I've got my process box, I'm going to take my first, my first variable, and I'm going to do something over here. 
I'm going to use what's called the what I call the PGA wheel. P G A. And PGA stands for practical graphical analytical. Now you'll see when we go through an example how this all works, but essentially we start at the practical, which seems like a good place to start. The first thing that we'll do is we'll formulate an English language question. The second thing we'll do is we will uh, make a graph of it, make a picture of, for example, uh, 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 make a picture. The third thing, I'll give you an example in just a second. The third thing is, if we see something in the picture, we're not just going to take it as true, we're going to actually back it up with a calculation. And finally, once we've done that, we're going to come over here and make a conclusion. Okay? So, and then convert that into something practical that we can do with that. And in doing so, when we, when we cycle through all these different things, essentially, we're going to, let's suppose we started from the bottom, we're going to either effectively, mentally, either cross these off as, no, we looked at it and there's no real, there's no real relation. And circle things that we find that there is a relation. So let's suppose that we looked at it and oven temp doesn't have anything to, doesn't appear to have anything to do with cycle time. Uh, price doesn't have anything to do with cycle time. Doesn't appear to have anything to do with cycle time. But shift does. That's what I've pictorially represented that. And each one of those is a separate turn through a different PGA wheel. Okay? So that's it. And um, if we give our example, if we give an example, and I'll just kind of draw this up, let's suppose that we did the following. We said we were interested in cycle time versus which waiter. So if we started with over here with our P, PGA, I'm not very good at these circles, practical. Go back to the white uh, picture. And the practical, one way of doing this is to say, I wonder if waiter if cycle time varies significantly with waiter or by waiter. Okay, so that's a question or a comment, I suppose. It's a it's a statement of wonder. Okay? So the first thing that we would do then is to take the data and to analyze it graphically. We're going to find out that for this particular thing we might look at a box plot or we might look at separate frequency charts. Let's look at a box plot. And this would be maybe, maybe we have, let's say we have three waiters. And they look like this. If we look at the data and the performance of cycle time, maybe Maybe uh, maybe they look like this. Now we'll understand what these boxes are a little bit later. But but this uh, this is cycle time. So what this says is essentially, on average, it looks like waiter number two is taking longer to deliver. So here it says, well, it certainly looks like maybe maybe. W2 is longer. Now, it certainly looks it, but the point is the difference in being somebody who simply reacts to data and somebody who is an analyst is the analyst is going to go the next step and say, yes, it certainly looks like there's a difference between these, but is there really a statistical difference? That's the difference between the analyst and somebody who is just playing around. Um, so we're going to learn how to actually be real analysts. Uh, if we don't already know how to do that. So we're going to back that up with a calculation. So we're going to get here and let's suppose that we do an analysis and we find that indeed um, the 
And I'll draw another picture because sometimes plots can be helpful in analysis. Let's suppose that we looked at our mean plots. And sure enough, if this is for W2 and this is for W1, I don't know why I did it in a different order, but I did. And here's my confidence intervals that, yes, it sure looks like uh, for real that um, waiter number two is statistically different than these other two. I've drawn little confidence intervals here to, to depict that. Yes, indeed, it, it, it's true. It's true, statistically different. Okay, so we're not quite done. We need to go back to the practical, which is really what are we going to do about it? So at this point, we would ask the question, I think, maybe there is an instant fix. For example, maybe the waiter get, needs to get trained, or maybe it's something worse than that. Maybe this has been a long string of poor performance, and it's time to let the fellow go. Um, okay, so th those would be going right to a solution. But many times it's uh, a question of, okay, we need to maybe drill into that a little bit. But the point of all this is, at least you're drilling into something that really is true. <laughs> it, the worst thing to do is to drill into why something is true when you have actually no evidence that it is. Um, so what statistics is, what the statistics and, and this process is really helping you do is to organize how I go about um, attacking the problem. And um, if we go back to the other one, I'm just going to tactically then um, circle this one. So if these, if these were all our variables, maybe we'd also be looking at shift and waiter at this point and solutions or uh, uh, making a deeper dive on that. Maybe that second waiter was on the second shift or the third shift, or maybe, uh, maybe it had nothing to do with that. Maybe the shifts were mixed, um, so maybe it had to do with something else. Different stuff served at dinner. Who knows? That's for a different piece, um, and, but uh, that uh, hopefully this illustrated how the process works. Okay. So, um, like I said, this is all in the, uh, in the handbook here um, in section one on, uh, on uh, these slides. Slides 11 and 12. Okay. And specifically, we can make a table if we wanted that said, hey, for given certain inputs like category, category, what are the graphs that we might do, uh, and so forth. Instead of doing that, what I want you to do is get used to using one, uh, Excel statistics. And you remember, uh, I think you'll remember that there were things labeled as one number or things like that. Uh, we, uh, we're going we're gonna to actually go through some examples, and you'll see why we're doing what we're doing um, and why it's all labeled this way. And here's the analysis in the Excel statistics that we'll use. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and move on. Again, the, for the journal, this is for your, you to fill out in the takeaways. Okay? All right. Last thing we want to cover today, and this is going to be the lengthiest part, is just some examples. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So if you're following along, this is slide 16 in the book. Um, let's just go ahead with that. So uh, let's walk through. Um, when in um, the objectives here in this section is really to execute um, through um, and, and give you an idea of how to do a one variable and two variable analysis um, for all the different combinations that we've got. So one variable, we'll look at numerical, we'll look at categorical. For two variable, we'll look at all three combinations, cat-cat, num-cat, and num-num. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's look through all of them. Um, here are the various places you can, um, where this, I think you'll find this to be helpful. Uh, when you take an initial look at the data, when you're analyzing the data, of course, and also when you're evaluating the improvements. I might also add that you can use this every day, uh, this sort of thinking. Um, so it's useful in dashboards. Uh, it's useful in recommending future improvements and so forth. Let's start with one variable analysis. We're going to cover the following cases, one num and one cat. Now, usually, I have a note here that says usually the variable is an output, but it doesn't absolutely have to be. So 
for example, you may want to drill department by uh, manager within department, and neither of those is an input. Maybe they're both uh, as an output. Maybe they're both inputs, or maybe it's just one in relation to the other, and you want to make some conclusions about it. That's fine. Um, okay, um, let's start from the start with this example. So in this case, we've got um, we've got a uh, uh, a file called uh, in your data file called DMV wait times, and what this is, the context is, it comes from, I think we can all appreciate this, we go to the DMV, and what do we do when we get there? We take a ticket, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait. Okay? Um, so, um, <laughs> column A contains the wait times of a number of people as they were measured coming through the DMV. Okay? Now, one of the things that we're going to assume in this, although it's not obvious, is that, uh, is that the data were taken in time order. So the first person uh, in there is uh, the first person who was actually in our study. The second person came later, and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through how this is done in one num, and then we'll just walk through some of the analysis. And I'll show you what's in there. Okay, DMP wait times. So we will open up the, uh, oh, there's my Excel statistics. We will open up the, um, the uh, file. This happens to be in 2007, so if you're using 2003, it'll look slightly different. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to draw the box. I know I've got it over here, but I'm going to draw it anyway. I'm going to draw it separately. So, let's see. There we go. So, uh, let's draw the box. So, here I've got wait times. And that is a num. Okay, what do I have over here? Nothing. So, I've got one num. Now, there are times when I'll have other things in my spreadsheet and I'll still want to choose a one num analysis or one num one cat because I'm only interested in that particular variable at that particular time. Suffice it to say, right now, I'm just interested in, say, getting a baseline for how long do people wait when they're at the DMV. Okay, so that's what we are solving uh, right now. Okay. Go ahead and select the data. You can either select the column, like I just did, or you can select the data itself, like I now just did. I want to reiterate, you don't copy it and paste it. You just select it. Let's go ahead and then click on one num. Bam. And there we are. <clears throat> it just did a one num analysis for us. You see, it, we got it right because it has the header right there. Um, and let's see what it does for us. So um, Excel Statistics does essentially three things when you calculate, when you start by calculating the, um, the um, when you start with the uh, one num analysis. And it does three really good things, three of the key things. First of all, it looks at the data in two fundamentally different, different ways. One is through a histogram which kind of gives us an idea of how the data accumulate. What I mean by that is, if we look at this, we see that the, the, the times are given on the bottom. And these are like different numbers of people. And um, how, how, how many occurred within those times, within those wait times, uh, is given up here by the frequency. So for example, it looks like this says between 18.4 minutes and 20.5 minutes, roughly 20 people, maybe 19, 20 people were in, uh, waited that long. Whereas people who waited 28 to 31 minutes, well, it looks like there's only four or so in the whole study. So a longer wait, like a, a wait of 29 minutes or 30 minutes, is relatively rare while a wait of about 18 minutes to 23 minutes is pretty common. Additionally, uh, waiting less than 10 minutes uh, is very uncommon too. So 
So uh, we can get all that from that. That's one of the contexts is to look at data in relation to other similar data points, right? These are all wait times. So that's what a histogram does. And um, I just want to show you a few of the features and kind of the way I like to handle it. First of all, the number of classes, it automatically comes up with 10. Let's leave that for just a moment. But the second thing is I like to give myself a little bit of space. I like to give my histograms a little bit of space to breathe. So I'm going to open it up just a little bit. I'll move from 10 to 5, moving down. And I'll move from 31 to 35. Ah, that's a little bit better. Okay, so now I can see a little bit. I, I have a little more room to breathe. And now maybe I'd like to have a few more of those, uh, a few more of those uh, box bars. Now, if I if I do too many, if I exceed the number of data points, it kind of ruins the point of having a histogram all together. There's a hundred data points, not too interesting. So uh, instead of that hundred, I'm going to go to let's say 15, uh, and 15 is pretty reasonable. So I, I don't mind that. I, I could use that picture. Looks like a good picture. Um, that helps me understand. It looks kind of like our friend the bell curve. Um, okay, let's now come to the next plot, which happens to be very similar to a time series plot. Uh, now, as I said, it's not. We don't know for sure it's a time series. What it really does is it plots the order of the data. Okay, so if these are somehow out of sequence, it's not going to know. So uh, if you want your data plotted in a time series or a trend chart, some people call it a trend chart. Um, put your data into order, and Excel statistics will plot it in that order. What can we tell from a trend chart? Well, it tells us something fundamentally different. While the top shows us how things are accumulating, in here we've got essentially time on this axis, on the x-axis, and um, we've got time on the x-axis right here, and we've essentially got uh, 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 how, much how much wait time uh, was in our sample. So it doesn't look like there's any particular pattern. It certainly doesn't look like it's trending. For example, we don't see lunchtime or anything like that. Maybe it got a lot worse over lunchtime. It's not that obvious here. If this is, say, 9 to 5 or something like that, we don't know. Okay? So it looks like it's a pretty... And in, in, we're going to learn to call this a very stable process as we, uh, as we go by. All right, so that's that. Uh, I do want to come up to here and notice uh, just a couple of things here and talk through it. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the mean and the standard deviation and the coefficient of variation. On the, on, that's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side are what statisticians often call is, um, it's, they, they, found, they, they form the fundamentals of what's called non-parametric analysis. Not that that really all that matters all that much, but these are things that are more robust and they don't move around so much. If you recall correctly, or if you recall from your maybe high school days, when you have something that's got, uh, or, or, or maybe even today, if you have data that are sometimes pulled from uh, maybe one person gets 100 on an exam and the rest of us around 50, uh, we often said, oh, that person blows the curve. Uh, what we really meant was that they pulled the mean uh, away from the true average or the usual average for the rest of us, and they moved it more toward them. Means will do that. They're not very sensitive. They're very sensitive to outliers. They get pulled a lot. Medians tend to not get pulled. In a case where you have bell-shaped data, they tend to be about the same. And in fact, if we look at this, 20.2 and 20, very, very, very close. Okay. I just wanted you to notice that. Now, not that it's that important um, in this particular analysis, but that's on the data and description, which is the default. On the summaries tab. We're going to work a lot in the summaries tabs. You'll see that the the it's also we have our friend the histogram, but it's got a few more bells and whistles. It's got we can actually show the values, which is helpful. Uh, we can change this from frequency to percentage, which is helpful. We can change the number of decimal points if we so desire, and lots of things like that. We can even do some things that we probably ought not do, such as change this to a line chart kind of goofy. Maybe do a cumulative distribution. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to go into those things, but um, they're there. <laughs> if you want to look into what they are, you know how to do it. You double click on the red and it'll tell you about it. Okie doke. Alright. On the bottom here is something that we will use a little bit later, and this is called a mean plot. 
and the mean plot essentially gives you an estimate for the mean. Now notice I said estimate, right? Because an, um, we haven't gotten into this so much between the difference between sample and uh, or descriptive statistics and true statistics, parametric statistics. Um, we will, uh, but not yet. We're going to take uh, baby steps toward that. Okay, I don't want to say baby steps. These are pretty real. These are pretty real big steps, and they're they're very practical. But what this tells us is essentially yes, it gives us an estimate for what the true mean of the population is, but. And this is a preview of what's coming. If we click on this confidence interval thing, that actually tells us it gives us like plus or minus our confidence <laughs> or, or our range that we're confident the true mean is between. And notice that we're saying that, well, yes, the the actual answer was about 20.2, but we're we're hedging our bets a little bit and we're saying, well, the true mean, if we went out and we got another 100 data points or whatever, it really could be anywhere between, say, 19.4 uh, and 21.2. Uh, um, so, again, I just made that up, but I was eyeballing this one. Um, so that's those are some of the things that we can look at in the summaries tab. And that's going to be pretty typical. We'll find a means plot in these uh, much more valuable when we look at uh, uh, cat versus cat, or num versus cat, and so forth. Okay. Um, so that's it for this. Okay, let me shut this down. All right. So uh, just to kind of come back, again, we've got our, uh, uh, in the slides, we, um, some of the things that we looked at. Here's our histogram. Here's our time plot. There's a few notes on what histograms are like as well. I think we already talked a lot about this. I did want to mention there's a few shapes. Um, the two most common are the bell-shaped and skewed data. Now, skewed in everyday uh, language means there's something wrong with it. Uh, to a statistician, there's nothing wrong with a tail that has a long t or a distribution that has a long tail. In fact, there's lots of distributions that naturally have that. Salaries of people at a company are, tend to be like that, where here are, here's the CEO and the executives, and this is the rest of us. Um, in uh, housing, prices tend to be like this, where here's Bill Gates's house and Michael Bloomberg's house, and here's our house over here. Okay, so um, in, in a good tip off on this is, first of all, look at the picture. <laughs> Please do that. Make the histogram. But if you see the mean and the median differing a lot, um, or differing significantly, you'll, it'll often be because the data are skewed. These points over here are pulling the mean, but they're not pulling the median so much. Okay. Um, the uniform, uh, which is flat across there, so equally likely to choose any of those. Uh, here's a bimodal distribution. It has two humps, so it's a two-humped camel. Uh, this should be something you should be on the outlook, uh, on the look for, on the lookout. Uh, because when you see this and nobody else has seen it uh, and they don't know about it, that probably means that there's a grouping that nobody knows about or hasn't figured out yet. And you can often formulate a solution around that. Um, I remember years ago finding something like this where everybody said that shouldn't be there and <laughs> just figuring out why it was there. This was at a manufacturing plant called Corning where they were measuring something and getting two different results, and it turned out to be an artifact of their data. Um, but it was real because they were passing it on to the supplier. Uh, here's an example of where you have outliers. It's normal except for this one, these guys sitting way out here. Very interesting. You want to make sure you notice that. Just think about that. What if you just took an average? You would have missed this whole thing. Okay, so make sure that you are taking that. And, and what does the uh, standard deviation even mean in, in such a case like this? All right. Finally, uh, uh, one that's my fa one of my favorites is the dog food distribution. You can see it kind of looks like a dog bowl or a dog dish. And um, the reason I I, uh, I like this is because I, I see this a number of times when people are massaging numbers. So there's a lot of times where I can tell that people are massaging numbers uh, if I see funny things in the data. This is uh, This is one of them. Okay. 
let's move on to one categorical variable. So in this case, we've got, um, in the example that we're going to go through, we've got um, defect types that are found in safety and reliability inspections compiled over six months. So somebody went and they marked all the different safety violations that they found on, say, a plant floor or in an office and uh, marked that over a, a six-month time period. And um, that's it. So let's take a look at it. I don't know why we're getting so much flashing here. Get back to here. Okay. So let's look at defect types. In this case, now I want to point out if you already have it already summarized in a table, just make a bar chart of it and that's fine. If you don't, if you have it separated out, Excel Statistics is going to be helpful. Now, you'll notice I went to go ahead and do this, but I didn't have Excel Statistics open, so you got to open Excel Statistics. Go back to our data. Here we are. Okay, I'm selecting this, and this time I'm going to select one cat. By the way, you should always check in here. Here we've got literally text data. So it makes sense that this is categorical. Category data is not all that interesting, um, but here you go. I mean, there's not much that we can really do. We can, we can uh, separate it out into its constituent parts and count how many occur in different areas. Um, and um, as Patrick earlier pointed out today, um, basically what this is telling me is I ought to focus on, if this is safety and reliability, I ought to focus on these two different safety problems, which appear to be something called S2 and something called M. Um, now, a little more to it is uh, on the second page on the, on the summaries tab, we'll actually be able to have confidence intervals on that. But for now, let's just leave it the way, um, the way that we talked about it, okay? That's it. There's not a lot more to glean out of this, out of this guy. And in fact, um, that's what this is showing right here. Uh, I guess I had C and H in this uh, particular one uh, as opposed to M and S2. All right, so a recap on the one variable analysis um, is to, first of all, label your variable, usually an output, but it works for all variables, as number, numerical or categorical. I, use, I just use N or C. Plot the data, make sure you make a histogram which shows the shape and a line plot which shows trends over time if you're doing numerical data. If you're doing category data, look at a bar chart or something called a Pareto chart, um, which I can also show you how to do. Um, it's not so fun in Excel stats, but we can show it to you um, as a precursor to um, um, to um, doing um, to doing control charts, because believe it or not, that's where it is. And then uh, we'll want to calculate, uh, for, if we're numerical, we'll want to calculate some descriptive statistics in the category. That, that's the mean, median. Everybody always says the mode, but nobody really ever calculates the mode, uh, or often calculates the mode. Um, and um, then if in categorical, you're just really making a data table. Give you an idea of what that is, let's go to here again, not defects types this. We're just talking about this data table right here. Okay, let's, um, let's go into, I want to show you how to do the, the, uh, the Pareto analysis. It is a little bit different. And um, a Pareto chart, for some reason, is found in control. And you can think of this as the larger, we're going to do, certainly do control charts from here, but if we think of it as the larger sense of quality control, then that's going to work for us. There's a little bit of a memorization game that you need to play here. You need to click on Attribute. And there's a tab in here that says Pareto. Okay? So you'll see that that's what this is right here. It's A through G or whatever. It's already a Pareto chart. Um, I'm going to show you this very quickly. I like to clear the data first. It works a little bit differently than regular Excel stats. So. So um, if you don't want to go through this right now, just enjoy the ride and, and look at it. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So click on the data. Let's clear it out. 
And then I need to copy and paste the data into here, unlike before where I just had to select it. It's a bummer, but there we have it. And this is the data that I need to select. Okay, so I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to paste it into here. I'm going to paste special, transpose, and values. Bam, and it puts it in like that. Okay. Now there are some nice things that can happen here. First of all, I can show it as a counter percentage. That's no big deal. Not sure why it's blinking quite so much. I can show the values or not. Often helpful. I can show the cumulative or not. So if some people don't want to see the cumulative, I can take it out. There we go. Okay, I'm going to put it back in. If I want to, I can hide certain variables. Like, suppose that error type M is out of the picture, and we're actually out of scope. We can put a little X there and watch what happens. Bam, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. I can also fix the order. So if I want to fix, uh, let's say that I was working on a process improvement, and... Um, I wanted to, at the end of a project, let's say improved S2 to, um, to a very small number, let's say 2 or 3, and I wanted to show, I wanted to fix that in the first position. I could type a 1 there. Uh, just to show you what's happening, I'll, show, I'll move, I'll move uh, PI to the final position. Let me make that a 7. Okay, you see what happened there? Okay, good. Right, I'll, I'll just take that out now. All right, um, let me, uh, then what happens if, and obviously you shouldn't do this with real data, but let's say that we improved the process and we made it down to a two. You could do a before and after shot that really shows, hey, we beat the heck out of S2. And it used to be like the top one, and now it's, the, now it's one of the lowest ones. And fixing it there it helps as a visual. Okay, so that's how to do a Pareto chart. Again, I'm going to not save when I close this. Pareto chart definitely takes a little bit of love. No question about it. If you didn't like that, go ahead and just use the bar chart and imagine these things being moved around. <laughs> not that difficult. Okay. Close this down and I will close down all of my Excel. All right. Okay, now let's move into two variable analysis, and this is really the more interesting stuff. Uh, anyway, we're going to cover three cases, and we're going to cover them fairly quickly. Um, the first is category output, category input. The second is numer uh, number output, cat input. And the third, which I just want to cover in a very quick way, num num, because we're going to spend a lot of time later on uh, linear regression which actually is, is, uh, has to do with this. So I just want to cover it in a very quick way, show that it's there and you know, and you know what to do. Okay, let's start with uh, category output, category input. And um, the, the project that we're, or the, what we're looking at here is the example is we have a company that's performing an in-house service to its customers. So maybe it's the gas company, they're coming over to check your meter or to do a meter read or maybe it's a cable company, they're coming over to fix something, um, or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a salesperson coming over to make an appointment. Well, one of the things that's problematic about people who make um, uh, sales calls or in-house services, um, sometimes, or I know another good one in, in the healthcare would be if somebody's going to get um, health insurance or somebody's going to get life insurance, they send over a, a nurse to do a blood test. Uh, for HIV and also for lipid profile um, uh, and so forth, and that probably for drugs, screen for drugs as well. Okay, um, um, okay. so there's lots of good reason. This happens a lot, but one of the problems can be that uh, the company sends out somebody and that person isn't home or there's a, a, only a minor in the house, so they can't get in, and that's, that's potentially a problem. So in, in this particular context, 
Um, let's suppose you were in a, an improvement project uh, for the gas company, and the gas company wants to lower their CGIs. They're wondering if, I wonder if, it differs by manager, because if I can find out um, if one manager has, is much less rigorous than the other in sending out things, that would make a difference. Okay? Well, lots of different examples that you can think of here. Uh, and and if, if you're doing this and listening along, what I'd like you to do is to think of an example uh, and uh, draw your own box. Uh, draw your own box um, and, uh, and go ahead and, uh, and do it. You can hit the pause button and make that happen. I'm going to go ahead and draw this. So here we've got CGI and here we've got manager. And this is A or B, and this is a, they're both cat variables. Okay, so that's the context that we've got. Hopefully you have your own example, and uh, we'll move on. So first of all, let's go ahead and do it in Excel statistics and see how that all works. Okay, I've got the data open. I've got Excel statistics open. Let's go ahead and do this. So the first thing to do is to select CGI and manager. In this case, a no is a good thing, right? I went there and it wasn't the CGI it could get in. <laughs> All right, it's a little confusing, like a double negative. Okay, in this case, we're not choosing one num or one cat, but we have two cats. I like the cat lady. Okay. All right, here we've got the uh, CGI and manager. The first thing is on the data and description, this just summarizes the two. And we can look at the data. Now, if this were all we were looking at, and for a lot of people, this is all they do look at, um, which is, um, you know, can lead to some my, my, myopic uh, thinking. Here we've got, um, there is a difference between manager A and B. But is it a statistically significant difference? In other words, if we went out and got another sample, would we expect to get the same results? Would we expect to get slightly different results? Um, you know, can we make any positive conclusions about, say, A is not doing his job, but B is? Because that's where we're headed, right? We're, we're drilling into this more. So that's the first question we want to ask. Okay. So this is not that interesting. In order for interesting things to happen, we need to click on the Summaries tab. So I clicked on the Summaries tab, and this takes us to this. Uh, I'd like us to focus on this one, which is a clustered bar chart. And um, also to say that sometimes you'll need to swap the variables. Um, and this is going to help us. We can show the, the values if we want. I don't know if that's important or not. but. There we go. Those are the valid. Those are the variables, and we've got percentages. And in some ways, it shows it the same or different. Um, some people might say they look pretty much the same. But I think this one, this view, uh, maybe brings out a little bit more of an easy comparison: how many no's versus how many yeses. It does look like maybe manager A is is getting a few more yeses than manager B, and that's bad. So, should we do anything statistically? So here's where, again, I would say, um, let, me, let me actually start to, to draw this example. We'll do it on the, on, the, on the blackboard. Here we've got our PGA wheel. I wonder if is manager A, uh, if manager is driving... CGI. I wonder if. So I'm going to make a graph first. Graph, in this case, is a clustered bar. <laughs> clustered bar. Okay. Careful with that one. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to analyze to see whether what we see is really real. Now, if, if you're like me, I probably would be ready to move on because uh, I'm pretty comfortable that there's not a lot of smoke here, uh, let alone a lot of fire. But let's go ahead and do that. One easy way to do that is by clicking on the confidence interval button right there. 
And we can see, for example, that the confidence intervals overlap. Now we're going to cover this in more detail later, but essentially what this means is statistically we can't tell the difference between these two numbers because the bottom one overlaps with the top over here. So it's just saying if we took another sample, all bets are off. We could get the answer to be vice versa of what we got right now. And that's all that that's saying. So what that's saying is that, yes, there's a difference, but it's not statistically different. And we can finish up with the conclusion there. Now, um, if you click on tests Rx2, which tests, which means one row by two, uh, more on that at some point later, but not too much. Um, we're going to see there's a couple of things here. One says hypothesis test, and we look at something that says a p-value. Okay, well what this is testing is are the are the proportions the same? Pi one, if they are, then pi one minus pi two, proportion one minus proportion two, is the same, and that would equal zero. If they're not, then they'd be different. We'll learn later that this p-value of 0.35 is telling us that no, it's not statistic they're not statistically different because it's greater than 0 0.05. Um, now for now, just learn that as a rule. Um, I, per personally, I like an overlapping confidence interval better. That makes sense for me. A statistician will roll over and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you just said that, Mark. Um, but it works better for me, and I think it works better for most people. It's not, strictly speaking, quite, 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 quite true, but it almost always is. Okay. Another way of looking at it is for a confidence interval uh, on the difference between them, and that is totally valid. And we look to see if it crosses zero. In this case, it does. It goes from negative to positive. You see that? From negative 0 0.05 to positive 0.16, which means that zero is a reasonable value for the difference, which means that there's no real difference. Okay? So those are the different things. Now, you can think of a confidence interval similar to like a poll. So you ever notice when somebody gives a polling number that they'll give uh, a percentage and then a plus or minus? That's what a confidence interval really is. It's that plus or minus. So it goes from the bottom to the top. So if somebody says, well, you know, uh, he was traveling at 55 miles an hour, plus or minus 3, the confidence interval would be 52 to 58, right? 55 minus 3 to 55 plus 3, which is 52 to 58, okay? So that's basically what a confidence interval is. Uh, again, we're going to cover this more later, but what this is pointing us to is to say, yeah, that difference is not statistically it's not a statistically valid difference to really hang your hat on. So let's look for, uh, let's look for something elsewhere. We go back to our, our blackboard. What this means is mm, no real difference. No big whoop. <laughs> so what this means is uh, find something else. Manager isn't going to get you where you need to be. Okay? That's what that means. Okay. Let's come back to here and uh, uh, to the slideshow and uh, kind of finish up this, uh, this, this piece. You'll notice that that example is given here as well, as well as our rule about p-value being low. One way that you can remember that is uh, later we're going to find out uh, there's a way of remembering it. If P is low, HO must go, or H naught must go. Uh, but for now, let's not worry about that right now. It, it means if it's less than 0.05, the difference is real. If it's not less than 0.05, we cannot conclude that any differences we're seeing are real. Okay. And the same thing that I just said about the confidence interval, that's in your notes. Uh, my, again, my personal uh, favorite is the picture, and uh, for the most part, it's going to give you something that's, uh, that's right. And here's our conclusion. We cannot say the percentage of CGIs from managers A is different than from manager B. Okay, let's move on uh, to numerical output and category output 
And before we do that, I would like everybody to come to um, the, the, to take a little bit of time, draw your own box, and come up from your project what would be uh, an output and what would be a category input. So um, let's, let's cover that um, right now. So take, take uh, 10 or 15 seconds and um, I'll start us out on this and then write it down. Hit the pause button if you want to and then we'll go. So let me just start for our restaurant one. You know, here's our process. Don't forget that, but I was looking at cycle time. Remember, that was the time to deliver it to your table. That's a num or an n. And then something that might change it would be maybe day of week. Okay, that's a cat. Or maybe a waiter. Remember that one? Again, it could be waitress, I suppose. Wait person is what I should use, but it's kind of long, so... I skipped that. Um, okay, or it could be manager. That's a cat. Or it might be cook. Maybe you have different cooks or staff, cook, cook team. Or it could be um, type of order. Is it an entree or appetizer? All those are cat variables. And this is pretty common where you have a number and you can break it up by lots and lots and lots of different cat variables. Uh, by the way, to have an output that's a number is actually particularly important. So the more you can get that, the better. Okay, hopefully you've got your own ideas uh, and uh, you have one that's going to work in the example that's going to follow. Okay, so we're going to do this example, and this is a little bit different than just uh, variables for a problem. Here we're looking at um, a before and after snapshot of our project. So let's suppose that a team went through and, um, and they were trying to reduce call backlog volume. So this could be for a, a call center, but you can also easily extend this to, say, a manufacturing company where they have backlog of parts. Uh, or um, you know a a project management office where they have a back or an IT uh, 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 department where they have a backlog of projects that they just can't get done. I know I've seen that before. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and analyze the data and backlogs before and after. But we always want to start out by doing our uh, our our box and labeling it. So we've got backlog volume, which is a number, and we've got time period either before or after, which is a category. So we've got one num, one cat, and that's the, that's the analysis that we're going to do. Okay, let's go ahead and um, I'm going to go ahead and close down CGI. No, I don't want to save that. No, I'm not going to save this either. I'm just going to leave Excel statistics open. And backlogs before and after is my file. So let's go ahead and select this. Whoops. I'm actually going to do one more thing. I'm going to sound like Columbo now. Just one more thing. Okay. And I'm going to actually draw my PGA wheel. And this time I'll draw it in white right in the middle. And uh, practical. I wonder if uh, the process, this, the backlogs are different. Let's just leave it as different for now. Obviously, we want it to improve, but after we made our change. Okay, that's what I wonder. Let's make a graph, let's calculate a number, and then let's do something about it. Okay, so that's the that's the process. Let's come over to here, Excel stats. 
Oops, I don't know why that's not happening. There we go. That's a little better. Go to our backlogs. Select the data. Excel stats. One num, one cat. Bam. Okay. First of all, uh, with one num, one cat, you do have to take a look and see if you got the N and the C right. If you didn't get it right, if it's backward, like maybe time period is the N and backlog is the C, it's going to, the nice thing is it's going to complain loudly at you and it's going to give you funny results. That may just be because you've gotten the columns mixed up. Excel stats is stupid. It doesn't know which column you put your, your backlogs in and which column you put your time period. So you have to tell it. Okay. Um, I shouldn't have uh, uh, been so hard on Excel stats. <laughs> uh, one thing I want to note first off is that you should see that there's a quick drop off in this and if you've surmised that maybe it's before and after the change, this is a good thing to see because it looks like backlogs have gone way down. That's a good thing. But let's just check and see. Okay. So to do that, we go to the summaries page, and there's a few different things that we can use to see that. One is what's called a multiple frequency chart, and this plots everything on one page. Okay, so for example, let me let me make this again 15, so it's a little bit easier to see. And you can see before and after. It looks like the befores are all over here, and the afters are all over here. So it certainly does look to me like there's been an improvement. So that's one way of doing it. The second, I think, is a more compelling way of looking at it, is the separate frequency charts. So go ahead and click on this little blue arrow. If you click on that little blue arrow, it will separate out the before and the after. And this works perfectly well for this. Where it doesn't work so well is if you have 10 or 15 categories. Um, and for that, a box plot works better. And we're going to quickly explore a box plot. We'll explore it more later. Um, but again, it looks like certainly before, many more backlogs, after many less backlogs. Finally, let's take a look at a box plot. Lots of different ways, unfortunately, to skin the cat on this one. And these look like little UFOs. What a box plot is, remember um, in your descriptive statistics, it gave Q1, Q2, I'm sorry, min, Q1, Q2, which is also called the median. Q3 and uh, the max. That's what a box plot is a plot of. It gives you the min the minimum. The 25th percentile is the bottom of the box. The median is given as the center of the box. Top of the box is the 75th percentile. And the top of the whisker there is the max. So you can tell right away, or in a, a quick sketch, whether one distribution is different than another. And this is helpful for having, uh, if you have like five or six different um, things, like let's say we have five or six different time periods, we'd be able to compare them all very quickly on the same page. Box plots are helpful. Uh, I'm not going to go tremendously into them uh, right now, but um, they're, they're very helpful. You can tell by, for example, by their positioning. I like to call it the UFO test. If one UFO is hovering above the other, you start to think, oh, well, maybe the means are different. If one of the boxes is a lot bigger than the other, you start to think, hmm, maybe the variances are different, or maybe the standard deviations are different. Um, so I call that the birthday present test. Anyway, those are the two uh, tests that we look at. Um, so that's that. So it certainly looks like, what I would say is it certainly looks like from our things that we looked at, in particular the separate frequency chart, it certainly looks like backlogs were reduced. Okay, but before we go into any conclusion, let's uh, let's make sure that we let's make sure that we nail it. So, it certainly it looks it looks like we improved. And for now, I'm going to say on average. Okay, so let's do a calculation to back that up. And here we go. Well, the quickest way, or the, the, the classical way to do it is to go to tests of two categories. We'll look at the before and the after, and we'll look at the p-value, and we'll look at the confidence interval. First, the confidence interval. I ask the question, does this overlap zero? The answer is no, because it doesn't go from negative to positive. You see, it starts at 34 and goes to 41. 
So this would essentially say that we've improved our backlog by either by somewhere between 34 calls and 41 calls. I think these are in thousands. That's significant. Uh, a 34 uh, calls and 41 calls, somewhere in between there. Best estimate, 37 and a half, 38 call, uh, calls, a backlog. Uh, that's, our, that's our best estimate of how much we've improved it. Okay? But it's definitely not straddling zero. So that's good. Second thing is, it gives you a p-value. Now, this actually is a number that's extremely small. And the reason you can tell that is because it's in scientific notation and it has 2.99e minus 25. Uh, to do that, I'm going to give you a quick, 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 quick tutorial on scientific notation if you're not there. Uh, if you already understand scientific notation, you can go ahead maybe two, three minutes. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead uh, with this. Um, basically, scientists have developed a way of looking at things that are very, very, of, of very efficiently writing, uh, very small numbers or very big numbers. I think if I make this very, very big, oh, uh, no, it's not uh, doing it for me. Yeah, if I did it enough, 25 is just too much, but if I did it enough and I gave it enough uh, decimal points, it would be able to um, print it all out. So, for example, if this was uh, 0 .00001, it might be able to print that out. Um, so let me just show you very, very quickly uh, how this all works, um, scientific notation. So, uh, basically, it's quite straightforward. So, uh, small numbers we usually know as like uh, 10. Let's say take 10, okay? and 100. Well, we can rewrite 100 as equal to 10 squared, right? Right. Okay, and 10 is 10 to the 1. So far, so good? Okay. All right, now what happens if we want to write 1,000? That's 10 to the third power. You see where this is going? It doesn't seem like we're gaining anything when we're using small numbers, but how about something like a million, that's 10 to the sixth, and now a billion. Now it's taking some time to write this, isn't it? Not fun. That's 10 to the ninth. A trillion. Losing count, you see. Not 19th, 9 is 10 to the 12th. Okay. All right, likewise, we can write very small numbers. We can write 1 over 100 as 0 0.01 as 10 to the minus 2, or 0 0.001 as 10 to the minus 3, and 0 0.0001 as 10 to the minus 4, and so forth. So if you recall, what we had was in our p-value was something like 2.99e minus 25. So what this is, is 299 with 25 zeros in front of it. One, two, three, four, blah, 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 blah. I'm not even going to write it, but it's a lot. It's 25 uh, zeros in front of that 299. So that's an extremely small number, certainly less than 0 0.05. Okay? Very short tutorial on scientific notation. Uh, one last thing I can't resist doing. So uh, hopefully, I mean, most people know this, but does anybody know one with a hundred zeros? I'm not going to write it all out. Da, 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 da. If it's a hundred zeros, which is 10 to the 100, there's actually a name for that, and it's called a Google. Now it's spelled like this, but that is <laughs> where Google got its name. Okay, back to Earth. Okay, so essentially what that means is we found out that this was uh, very significant. One last thing that we could do is we could look at the mean test right here, the mean plot that's given below here, and we put on confidence intervals, and we're looking at a 95 confidence interval. We'll find that that's equivalent to having a p-value of 0.05. There's some equivalency. 
look at that. There is absolutely no overlap with those two things. That really means that that change is real. All right. So going back to our PDA wheel, PDA, PG, A, <laughs> getting a little bit goofy here, is yes, the, chain, the improvement is real. And that means probably that your conclusion is going to be keep the change, baby. Keep the de delta, baby. Okay, let's let's stay on this train. We want to keep it going. All right. So that's the that's the thinking process right there. And uh, uh, once you get good at this, um, you can do it, you know, very very quickly. Um, and uh, I think what you'll find is you'll find that this is a this is a very helpful helpful uh, helpful tool to look through. All right. So that really takes us all the way through. You can see that we've, we've covered all these slides, including the, here's this, here's differences before and after. Um, there's even something where we tested standard deviations. Don't want to go into that right now, but uh, we can also test the standard deviations. Last one is number versus number. And as I said before, I don't want to go into this too much, but, but um, I'll, I'll just cover this. Uh, the example that's given in the book is mileage versus speed. So mileage is our output and speed is our driver. You'll pa pardon the pun, but the question is, does speed drive gas mileage? So let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up that file, which is mileage versus speed. In this case, we've got num num or two num. And what just happens comes up. So just you, you recognize this. Um, uh, Excel statistics comes up with a scatter plot of gas mileage versus speed. Now, uh, the convention is to put gas mileage on the Y, speed on the X. If you've got them backward, you can, by using the drop, then it's going to lead as they are. Okay, and, and for now, what I think we want to do is just be able to interpret the scatter plot, okay? On correlation and linear regression page, there's a test of hypothesis for are these two things really correlated? And there's a equation of a line and all the rest of this stuff. There's something called ANOVA and residuals analysis. We are going to cover all of this when we do regression. We're going to cover it in much more detail. For now, I want us to be very good at understanding how to read this plot right here. Okay. So just to kind of finish this up, just to kind of finish this up, um, uh, here's the scatter plot. And what are the things that we want to look for in a scatter plot? Uh, first of all, we want to see if there's any, um, what's the form of it? And by this we mean, is there a line? Is it a line or is it some other shape? The one we're most interested in is a line. In this case, we can probably if we want to imaginarily lay down our pencil on this, we can see that maybe that might be a pretty good line that we would uh, line up. The second thing is the direction. In this case, it's a negative direction. It's going downward. As you increase speed, gas mileage decreases. So we call this negative. Third thing is the, the, the strength of it. And in this case, it's pretty strong. It's a pretty clustered uh, set of points. We're going to learn more about this uh, when we cover regression, but that ought to be that those are really the three questions that you want to ask. The last, uh, the last thing that you want to always note in any scatter plot is any outliers that you see. Here we don't really have any. I draw, just drew a yellow point, but if you saw a yellow point that looked like that, you'd certainly want to question, why doesn't this follow the rest of the trend? Those are questions that are really going to lead you to real learning. Um, okay, so for now, let's uh, call it a day. And um, just, to, just to let you know, I, we've only scratched the surface on regression and um, not going to cover any more on it. Okay, 
In the back of this uh, section are lots of exercises. I think there's five as part of your uh, work this week. Um, if you're a black belt, it's to do all these, um, all of these exercises. Uh, there are answers, so uh, you can check yourself, which is good. Um, but um, uh, there may be one or two additional questions that you want to go through. Okay, so um, we really covered a lot in this. We covered how to do. We covered the uh, how to do analysis, which is really the uh, the whole draw the box and label your inputs as num and cat. And then also use that PGA wheel, right? Practical, graphical, analytical, which will tell you um, uh, basically when you go through all those motions, it'll, it'll prompt the right questions and it'll uh, let you know what you need to do if you make conclusions. Okay, we covered one variable analysis for numbers and for cats. And two variable analysis, we covered all the different possible cases, cat-cat, num-cat, which is the most common, and we just scratched the surface of num num. Um, so hopefully uh, you've got enough to go uh, for now. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday or Friday um, and talk with you later. Okay.